and welcome to the UW Marathon County campus for this afternoon's candidate forum, Living Better, Longer, Alcohol, Mental Health, and Tobacco's Impact on the Community. My name is Eric Giordano, director of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, and I will be moderating tonight's event. At this time, we ask you to please make sure that all electronic devices are silenced. Also, for tonight's event, um, any heckling, grandstanding, or other inappropriate behavior by audience members will be grounds for dismissal from the event. We'd like to thank campus dean Sandy Smith and the UW Marathon County campus for hosting the event and we would like to acknowledge the three groups which have made the, this event possible. The Marathon County Alcohol and Other Drug Partnership Council, the Central Wisconsin Tobacco Free Coalition, and the Marathon County Suicide Prevention Task Force. At this time, I would like to welcome eight men and women who are seeking to represent voters in Central Wisconsin for seats in the Wisconsin State Assembly and Senate. I think it is particularly important and fitting that in addition to introducing them that we thank them for their participation here this afternoon and I'd like to introduce them and perhaps give after I'm done with all eight uh, give them a round of applause for their uh, participation here tonight. So in order uh, from left to right, from your left to right, I'd like to introduce from Senate District 23 Senator Pat Kreitlow. Uh, to his left, Senate District from Senate District 29, Senator Russ Decker. Assembly District, from Assembly District 85, Representative Donna Seidel. From Assembly, or hoping to represent Assembly District 85, Charles Eno. Uh, it looks like Jim Moss is before Charles Eno. Sorry about that, Jim. Charles Eno is to his left. <laughs> Thank you. From uh, Assembly District 86, Representative Jerry Petrowski. Also hoping to represent Senate uh, Assembly District 86, Todd Punky. And finally, hoping to represent District 87, Frank Rutherford. I'd like to thank you all. <laughs> the primary purpose of tonight's event is educational. Specifically, forum organizers desire to increase public awareness of key health behaviors by our citizens that make a difference in the quality of life in our communities. For our format tonight, a panel of distinguished media representatives to my left will ask questions about alcohol and other drug use, tobacco, and mental health. Candidates will have one minute each to answer the questions. After every candidate has had a chance to speak, we will have a brief discussion segment in which the designated media panelists will have the opportunity to ask a follow-up question. Candidates will then have 30 seconds to respond to the follow-up question and interact with one another. Following the panel question and answer session, the audience will have an opportunity to ask a limited number of questions about the topics at hand. And now I'd like to introduce our media panel. On our media panel tonight, we're pleased to welcome WAOW-TV9 news anchor Pam Warnke, WSAU radio news director Matt Lehman, and Central Wisconsin Media Regional Executive Editor Mark Baldwin. Thank you for being here tonight. As mentioned, tonight's event is designed to educate and inform. For this reason, we will begin with a brief update on nonpartisan statewide plans to improve healthy living in Wisconsin. For this information, we turn now to Joan Toyer, who will give a brief presentation. She is a health officer with the Marathon County Health Department. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our candidate forum. As Eric indicated, the purpose of tonight's uh, forum is to increase our awareness of key health behaviors that make a difference in the quality of life in our communities. We all want to live in a healthy community. As you may or may not know, 
Local health departments, along with community partners, are charged with creating healthy communities. Every 10 years, the state puts out a roadmap for us to address leading causes of illness, injury, disability, and death. In August, our new state health plan, Healthiest Wisconsin 2020, was released. And with that release, challenging us to create communities whereby everyone lives better, longer. So what guidance does Healthiest Wisconsin 2020 roadmap provide for us? To begin with, the plan shares a set of core values including fairness and justice, partnerships, and shared responsibility. Healthiest Wisconsin 2020 emphasizes the alignment of policies, systems, and incentives to make healthy choice the easy choice. The end result, we will see improved health access across the lifespan, eliminating health disparities, and ultimately achieving health equity. In order to achieve our vision, everyone lives better longer, the plan acknowledges there are 12 areas of health we need to improve uh, to effectively address the leading causes of illness, injury, disability, and death. Today, we'll be examining action that is needed in three of those 12 areas, and that includes alcohol and other drug use, mental health, tobacco use, and exposure. Healthiest Wisconsin 2020 reinforces that in addition to addressing the 12 health priorities, we will also need to work on improving social and economic factors that have a powerful influence on our health. Some examples of what are considered pillar objectives in the state health plan include delivering policies that reduce poverty, improve education, and foster health and social networks. To achieve improved health in the area of alcohol and other drug use, mental health, tobacco use, and exposure, public health system partners will need to work together to develop and adjust policies to change our physical and social environments in which healthy behaviors are the convenient, desirable, and default decisions. Our individual health behaviors are only partially a function of our personal and conscious choice. We all know that behaviors are also learned in families and are influenced heavily by marketing, ease of choice, cost, and cultural norms. This afternoon, you will hear about the various directions we can take in realizing our vision, a vision where everyone lives better longer, a vision whereby individuals, families, and communities are not impacted by irresponsible drinking, unmet mental health needs, and the use and exposure of tobacco. As you hear from your candidates, I ask each of you to think about how we can work together to develop policies, creating physical and social environments in our communities whereby the healthy choice is the easy choice. In closing, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Eric and his team from the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service for his leadership and their leadership in organizing today's forum. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. And we'll begin tonight's discussion with the topic of alcohol use. I will now read a statement created by event organizers, and then we will begin with our question and answer period. The Wisconsin Epidemiological Profile on Alcohol and Other Drug Use for 2008 states, quote, Wisconsin's rate of alcohol use and misuse are among the highest, if not the highest, in the nation, and that as of 2007, Wisconsin high school students have a binge drinking rate that is the third highest of reported states, end, end quote. The Wisconsin State Council on Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Prevention Committee's Alcohol, Culture, and Environment Work Group says, quote, the consequences and costs of alcohol misuse in Wisconsin are staggering and have created a diverse range of problems. Changing Wisconsin's culture of alcohol will require an equally diverse set of solutions, including new policies and practices 
in all segments of the community, end quote. Alcohol misuse among minors and young adults needs to be addressed urgently within our own local communities. I turn now to Pam Warkey, who will ask the first question. All right, thank you, Eric. Wisconsin leads the nation, as you just heard, in a number of alcohol-related statistics, including youth binge drinking. What ideas do you have to combat the problem of youth binge drinking? We'll begin uh, the answers tonight with starting with Senator Pat Kreitlow. You have 60 seconds. All right, Eric, Pam, thank you very much. Thank you to the sponsors and everybody for attending today's event. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I regret that my uh, opponent from Eau Claire, much like our Marshfield Forum, was not able to make it to the far eastern part of the district and meet with you, but I'm happy to tell you a bit about what we've been doing in the legislature and how we want to work on problems related to alcohol use, tobacco use, mental health issues, and so forth. The legislature, while it can work on policy items, uh, and can also help promote education, public health, and enforcement is only part of the equation, especially in anything that deals with messages that go out to young people. We can certainly work on policy areas like making sure that there is zero tolerance for alcohol use and abuse, which could lead to binge drinking. For example, every time we see a crackdown on something like athletic code violations or parents who are penalized for hosting parties, we show that we have the policies in place that prove that Wisconsin does not tolerate a culture of binge drinking. But a lot of it is also messaging, which from my media background, I can tell you, probably has more weight. And I look forward to discussing more some of the media approaches that we can take to get an anti-binge drinking message out to Wisconsin's teenagers. Thank you, Senator. Senator Russ Decker, you now have 60 seconds. Well, I'd like to join Pat and the other panelists up here in thanking you for putting this forum on. I think it's very important. You know, in the last session, uh, Donna and Jerry Petrowski, myself, and Pat Kreitlow all supported really increasing the drunk driving penalties in the state of Wisconsin. And I think that was uh, involved a lot of teenagers. Unfortunately, there were a few of them that lost their lives in accidents. They and their parents came down and met with us and Governor Doyle and began uh, an approach to toughening up the penalties. So I think there was some involvement. And as Pat mentioned, uh, while we put the policies in place, a lot of it has to deal with parents. A lot of it has to deal with peer pressure. So I think as those things continue to go and the media keeps talking about it and reporting it of the tragedies that can happen, uh, if you're drinking, especially if you're drinking and driving, I think that, that heightens people's awareness. Thank you, Senator Decker. Representative Seidel, you now have 60 seconds. Thank you very much, and my thanks to, to the hosts and all of the participants. Obviously, there is not a silver bullet to answer this problem and address this problem thoroughly. We did significantly crack down on drunk driving in Wisconsin. Um, for the first time in over a decade, in large part because of the very strong message we continue to hear from our community. And young people not only are very involved in this issue, but they were on the forefront of getting these changes made. And I want to thank particularly the young people from the D.C. Everest Middle School who were champions of this cause. I think that when we look at binge drinking and young people, we have to look at uh, the myriad number of issues that affect and impact children and their families and address all of those, starting from the need for early childhood education, quality child care, great opportunities for health care, and a number of other issues that we'll have a chance to talk about at this forum. Thank you, Representative Seidel. Mr. Moss, you have 60 seconds. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit uh, skeptical about any groups that are trying to use the uh, government of the state of Wisconsin to change Wisconsin's culture. Um, I don't think you can do that by force. You have to use persuasion and education. And I think we, we do that through our school system and public service announcements and and social groups in our community. And uh, I think th that's the way we'd want to go rather than use the government. Um, <clears throat> as far as the youth binge drinking, I'm not sure who was included in the youth. Um, young adults, libertarians would say young adults should be not be considered as children and they should be um, have all the rights and privileges uh, once they reach the age of majority. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Mr. Eno, you have 60 seconds. Thank you very much. I'm not sure just exactly what I can offer at this point because, frankly, I've been, um, this is my first shot at being in an elected office, and so I'm not sure that I can 
and I can offer that much. However, I do believe that uh, regulation and law is not going to solve the problem. I think that we need to educate and show our young people and those who are involved in binge drinking the seriousness of what they are doing. As far as the other areas of drinking is concerned, I think we need to, we need to strengthen the law as far as OWI is concerned. And instead of letting someone go four, five, six, seven, nine times, we need to stop that and bring it under control in, a, in the earliest possible stages. Uh, I will be spending a great deal of time when elected in, in, in this particular area, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Eno. Uh, Representative Petrowski, you have 60 seconds. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel and thank everybody for inviting us and for the uh, public showing up. I think this is certainly some very important topics. And uh, I'd like to talk about drunk driving. The bill that was done, I think, is a step in the right direction. The breathalyzer part of this uh, has shown great success in some other states like Oklahoma. And I would hope that in the period of time we're going to realize that, yes, we indeed made some unique strides in trying to deal with drunk driving. I also have some problems with the repeat offenders. And I don't know how you get these people off the road except to incarcerate them or to punish them worse than we are now. Uh, in my mind, there's just absolutely no reason why somebody should be picked up, you know, five times, seven times, eight times. Uh, we need to get the people, the repeat offenders, off the road. Um, I think education is such a major, major part of this. My son always tells me, Dad, everything starts at home. Well, personal responsibility is a really important factor in this, and I think kids have to be taught that from young on, and the damage that they can do by indeed drinking and so on. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Petrowski. We'd now like to turn to Mr. Punky. You have 60 seconds. Thank you very much. I would also like to echo uh, thanks for everyone who's attending as well as the panel and putting this forum on. I think it's wonderful to have an opportunity to talk about solutions to our issues. One of the things that I'd like to see as far as the binge drinking goes, and that is uh, some increased checkpoints. Uh, let people know that it's important to us in our community. When we go out and we <coughs> have uh, safety officers patrolling the streets, letting people know that we're going to enforce the laws, I think that sends a message that we won't tolerate it. Just about everyone up here has talked about education. I think that's important that we continue to do that in our health classes, in school, as well as our driver's ed classes, let people know what the consequences are. Uh, Jerry talked about uh, modeling and mentoring, saying it starts at home, and that's exactly right. It starts at home. But something else I would like to see is I'd like to see a strong mentor program in the 18 to 30-year-old range, because those are the, that's the age group that young adults are gonna look up to. And as parents, we can say as much as we want to, but they need to hear that from someone in their own peer group. Thank you, Mr. Punky. And finally, we will hear from Mr. Rutherford. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with the youth binge drinking. It has a lot to do with being at home. You know, it comes from home. It learned habits, if you will, and education. I read a study about, they were actually studying why people are dropping out of high school. Well, the, when they were all done with the study, what they come up with was just on the mere fact of having somebody trying to do math problems in sixth grade with uh, eighth grade reading abilities, well, once they start having problems, then they start becoming, they start acting up and the training for our teachers aren't, isn't there for problems like this. I mean, teaching a person to be as social as sociologists or you know the psychologist along with being a teacher is pretty tough but I think education is the big thing at least helping the teachers out with these situations and maybe teaching them how to deal with this kind of problem thank you mr. Rutherford we're now entering what we might call a discussion section uh, and we'd like to turn now back to Pam Warnke for a follow-up question You'll each have no more than 30 seconds. You may interact with one another if you choose. Thank you all for your responses. Let's zero in a little bit more on drunk driving. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Survey on Drug Use and Health says Wisconsin, Wisconsinites or people here are more likely than anywhere else to drink and drive. The state is among the highest incidents of drunken driving deaths in the United States. 
I want to know what kind of policies you support that would curb this dangerous behavior. Senator Decker, you mentioned that um, legislators have been working on stricter drunk driving policies. For example, what would you do in the case of a first offense? Do you think that that's a way to curb the issue, to make that a, a stiffer penalty? As Representative um, Seidel, you said there's no silver bullet. How do you address the culture of drinking in this state to stop it before it starts and to penalize it once it happens? Why don't we start with Senator Decker and we'll go to his left and conclude with Senator Crightwell. Well, as we mentioned, we did toughen the penalties on drunk driving and, you know, ignition interlock are in there. And, but the thing of it was, every session that uh, we've been in recent history or memory, we've toughened the penalties on drunk driving going back to the 90s. The thing of it is, judges have had a lot of latitude in what they determined to be a penalty. And they weren't enforcing it to the, where they could, so people came to us to change up the law. And we did that. And I think it, we did it in a very responsible way. Uh, the, the first offense is not a felony. Uh, some people say, like, Illinois has a felony offense. <coughs> Go ahead and finish your thought. Okay, and, yeah. But the thing is, most of the uh, citations are given by local municipalities, not by state government. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Seidel. Thank you. Well, I have talked to judges both in this community and neighboring communities alike, and they are very enthusiastic about the new law. And again, it has just started, and we're just beginning to see what I hope to be very positive effects. In addition to harsher penalties, I am particularly proud of the fact that this new law also has two other really key components, and that is treatment and prevention measures. And that's what I believe will go a long way in addressing and dealing with this out of control culture of drinking in Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Moss. First of all, I'd like to say that I, I think the idea of um, roadside checkpoints for drug driving is a terrible idea. It's a violation of the Fourth Amendment and uh, I don't think we want to go there. Uh, roving patrols, highway patrols are much more efficient. Um, also, I think that the Wisconsin's reputation for drunk driving is inflated. Uh, year after year we hear that um, we look at the statistics and this year is the lowest of year of, for traffic deaths since World War II. And then next year it's even lower and, and, and so I think that there's a, a statistic. I think, I, I think somebody's messing with the statistics. And I think that uh, Wisconsin is tied for 30th place as far as fatal traffic crashes. OK, thank you, Mr. Moss. Mr. Eno. I have some firsthand experience with alcohol causing a suicide situation. And I am very concerned about um, educating, but as well as catching, and I don't mean catching in terms of uh, the police catching, I mean the family observing and catching uh, the problems that exist. I think uh, the children need to be well educated and show that, that the tremendous problems that exist by binge drinking, uh, I think that we have to equip our educators uh, to do as, as good a job as they possibly can in this particular area. Thank you, Mr. Eno. Representative Petrowski. Well, I think it's important to note that the drunk driving that we're experiencing right now, the number of calls that are coming in, really have increased dramatically because of the use of the cell phone. Drivers, anytime they see somebody that's over the line or driving erratically, they get on the phone and they call up either the county sheriff or the state patrol. And I think that has enabled us to indeed try to get a lot of drunk drivers off the road. There's something else that I think is worthwhile, and it basically just deals with the driving issue while drunk. It's a safe ride home program. That I know has saved a lot of time. Uh, if I may one, continue. Sure. One last thought. The, uh, the penalties that I think could be enforced, we maybe could do a better job on. Uh, just finding somebody or you know something like that is one thing. But if we had a program where public service, where they had to be dressed in a pink jumpsuit or whatever, and it says, I'm a drunk on the back, I think that would be more of a deterrent. <laughs> OK, thank you, Representative. And we'll turn to Mr. Punky. OK, th thank you. Something the Tavern League does have is a safe ride program. And as Jerry talked about, that's a program that does take drunk drivers off the road. Unfortunately, it's not in every county in Wisconsin. I would like to encourage uh, 
the counties that don't have that program to put that program in and maybe something we need to look at as a legislative body is to increase the licensing costs for liquor establishments in the counties that don't have the safe ride program to encourage them to form a safe ride program and get additional drunk drivers off the road. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Rutherford. Well, I think treatment would go a long ways. Uh, and it seems like I've, I've known a couple personal with some people that they have trouble getting any help with their alcohol problem because there's so many problems that are out there and there's no money for it. I think part of that fine should go to some kind of county, county place where they get more, they get like an eight week course or something like that. You go there eight one hour sessions and that doesn't really do anything. I think if you get right after it and put them in a 30 day deal or something in that order, well, I think that'd go a long ways. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Uh, Senator Kreitlow. And let, let me uh, wrap all this up finally by getting back to the root of the question about drunk driving and, and uh, what, we, what we've had done about it, what we could do about it, and one of the more surprising moments of my past four years in office. Of the eight counties I serve in, in one of the counties, uh, all the judges and the DA called me in and wanted to talk about what we might be working on. And it'll amaze me, it amazed me and it'll amaze other people what they said. They said, don't you dare increase the, the penalties for first, second time around, and here's why. Because it'll make you feel good, but you won't give us the resources to actually either jail these folks or go into treatment. We expect some resources toward treatment. That is, in fact, what we did this time around, was not just beef up the penalties, but make treatment options more available. We followed their advice. Thank you very much, panelists. We'd now like to turn to WSAU News Director Matt Lehman for our second question. This is something that some of you talked about in your answer to the last question, uh, that access to alcohol before the legal drinking age of 21 uh, can be a major contributor to alcoholism in adulthood. Uh, right now, the current law says that minors of any age are allowed to consume alcohol in a licensed establishment as long as they're accompanied by a parent, a guardian, or a spouse who has reached the legal drinking age of 21. But I'd like to know are your thoughts on allowing those under 21 to consume alcohol in licensed establishments such as bars and restaurants. Thank you, Matt. For our first response, we'd like to turn to Representative Seidel and we'll follow from her left. Thank you. You know, I think that increasingly we have held bartenders and servers responsible and accountable for the business and their establishments. I think one of the ways that we enable them to be accountable is to make sure that everybody in the facility is of drinking age before they are served and however they are served. So I do support the idea of no exemptions or exceptions under any circumstances. Thank you. We'll now turn to Mr. Moss. Okay. Um, in a bar or anywhere else, bar or restaurant or anywhere else, uh, uh, when children are in the presence of their parents, their parents are responsible for them, not the state of Wisconsin. And so um, I think that um, that's fine and that's the way it should be. Uh, make their parents responsible for them. They can model um, appropriate behavior for their children. Uh, they uh, may be, uh, further, have a further encouragement to drink in moderation while their children are present. Uh, their children can learn social drinking from their parents rather than binge drinking from their peers uh, because that's going to probably be what happens uh, if they don't get uh, good examples on, on social drinking. And uh, as far as the uh, young adults over the age of majority, again, uh, the state of Wisconsin should not be treating them as children. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Mr. Eno, you have 60 seconds. I was born and raised in Lincoln, Nebraska, and the state of Nebraska is quite strict as to children being in bars. Uh, and I, 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 I say children from the age of ability to walk all the way through the age of 18. I don't think that they should be allowed in there at all in any bar. A restaurant, that's another problem that you have to face, but bars are, are difficult. We have a culture of alcohol and alcohol abuse in the state of Wisconsin, uh, and that goes way back into history. We need to look at that culture and see if there isn't some way that we can break it. Um, the parents are responsible for their children, and we need to make parents and hold parents responsible <coughs> for their children. We do it in other ways. 
uh, and we really need to look at it from the standpoint of education and helping the parents to reach their children and show them the importance and the critical nature of what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Pachowski. Thank you. I think uh, children are the responsibility uh, for their, to their parents. I can't imagine parents taking a child that's 10 or 12 years old into a bar and providing them with alcohol. I think that is over the line. However, let me tell you that just an example, my son was in the military and he came home from Iraq and he's 19 years old and he goes to the bar with me and he wants to have a drink. That's a complete different situation in, than a parent going there with a 12 year old kid and giving him alcohol. Okay, thank you, Representative, and we'll turn now to Mr. Punky. I, I believe we need to revisit the laws as far as uh, parents buying their, their kids alcohol. Jerry, by the way, thank you to your son for the service in Iraq. And I think he- He's not in the military, I was using that as an example. Oh, I thought, I thought he was, okay. <laughs> but, the, but that is an issue that we have a societal conflict with. You know, we allow our 18 year, year olds to go off to war for us, but we don't allow them to, to drink in, in public institutions. And I think that's something as a legislator we need to look at. Thank you. Mr. Rutherford, 60 seconds. I'd have to probably parrot the, the, these last two fellas. Uh, if we're willing to send them to war at the age of 18, they should have the right to go in the bar with their parents to drink. Anything under 18, I can't see. And I guess I was never allowed. So, <laughs> you know, it just, it's definitely a parent thing, but I, I can see the age being raised to 18. Thank you. Senator Kreitlow, you have 60 seconds. And I was a co-sponsor of the bill that would have raised that age to 18 because, again, it, it, it is uh, ridiculous that current statutes would allow, say, a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old to have a drink with their parent. Uh, 18 is not what some people in this room and other people would like to see. They'd like to see that at 21. Uh, I don't know that that would pass for reasons that I think were uh, put forth very uh, uh, very well by some of the previous speakers, but I think that at least having it as 18 is a way to take care of a real flaw in current law and still allow somebody to take their 19 or 20 year old and show an example of, of uh, uh, having that one drink at dinner at a restaurant uh, and going from there. So I would uh, expect to see that bill reintroduced in the next session. Thank you, Senator Decker. Well, this is my libertarian streak. You know, I, you know when we turn 18, we have to sign up for the selective service. When we're 18, we're, we're considered responsible enough to get married, to have kids, to take out home loans. You know, and those soldiers that are over defending the country are deemed to be old enough to decide whether or not to shoot at someone or defend a, their uh, comrade right next to them. So I think this is a bit of a solution in search of a problem because, you know, I frequent taverns around here. I don't see parents bringing their kids in for a Friday night fish fry or for a pizza or to watch the Packer game. Um, I think the, the law ought to be at 18 because it was when I turned 18. It was 18 for beer and it was 21 for liquor, which other people in this room I'm sure have experienced. So, uh, I think uh, mom and dad are very good in this area. I don't think, I don't see kids doing it in taverns. Uh, as uh, Chuck Eno pointed out, a restaurant's a little bit different. And I think if, you, if a restaurant serves wine or alcohol and the family wants to go in there and have a meal together, they should be allowed to do that. Thank you. We turn back to Matt for a follow-up question. The first main question that I posed to you talked about alcohol at licensed establishments like bars and restaurants. Let's set that now in the house, that uh, right now parents, if they choose, can offer their child a glass of wine or something to drink that's allowable under law. Uh, I want to bring up the example here of these key parties, that uh, every time, every spring we hear this around prom parties and graduation, that there's this idea where parents will allow their children to come into the home and they say, give up your keys and you can have a beer or you can have wine or you can celebrate because the idea is, is that it's done safely. Is there something, is there a role that a state lawmaker can play in dealing with that? Do you have any positions on that? Let's begin with Mr. Rutherford, please. Well, when my son graduated from high school, I chased the, the adults out and it was just the kids. Well, they weren't getting past me and we took their keys and they had themselves a time and that was it. I mean, it seems like if you give them a little bit of time and a little bit of leeway and a little bit of leash, you'd be surprised what you get back. And 
as far as the legislator doing uh, legislation doing anything in that regards I guess we'd have to leave that to the parents okay we're going in mid reverse order here mr. punky I think the key parties are a terrible idea and I would hope that uh, anyone here would not participate that or or be a sponsor of one of those parties I don't I would have to echo mr. Rutherford's sentiments as far as uh, the legislature not being uh, playing a part or a role in that Representative Petrowski. Within the home, I think it's the parent's responsibility. And I'm not sure where you're going to, Matt, where you'd like to draw the line. You know, there are people that have an Easter meal where they all celebrate the feast and everybody drinks some wine. Uh, do we make that illegal? I don't think that's a legislature should be involved in the, in the person's home. Thank you. Mr. Eno. <coughs> Alcohol is not a solution to a problem. The problem is that we make it too readily available. Um, I have four children, and none of them had a drink until they were old enough to do so. And I was responsible for them, and I made them know that alcohol is not a solution to a problem. We have wine at our Christmas and our Thanksgiving dinner table, if our children choose to participate in it at that time, they would be allowed, but not the little ones. Thank you. Mr. Moss. I don't know about key parties. Uh, uh, when I had kids, I would have been, <laughs> I would have had nothing to do with a key party. Um, but um, occasionally my kids were, could have uh, a sip of beer at the dinner table uh, just to see what it was like. I figured that it'd be better if they learned that from me than uh, from their, some of their friends. And so I think there again, it's, it's up to the parents, not the state, to make decisions like that about the children. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Representative Seidel. Thanks, Eric. Well, Matt, your question really goes to the extreme example of condoning underage drinking, I believe, and more and more of our families and communities are understanding the error of being involved in, in a situation like a key party. And I'm really proud of the Wausau community and so many other communities across the state, and in fact, across the country, that are doing the important things to try to weed out the problem. That is not by promoting legislation, but rather by concentrating on public education and community awareness issues to reduce the incidence of these kinds of events that most people find quite outrageous. Thank you. Senator Decker. Well, thank you. Uh, your home is your castle. But having said that, it's already illegal, Matt, to have parents serve underage kids of other people's families, or kids of other parents. So uh, that's already in place. And I think it, the peer pressure is one thing. We talked about the drunk driving thing, Matt. So, you know, I, I just think the, the, the laws are in place. How they're being enforced has a lot to do with local law enforcement. And Donna would know that because she was the first uh, female cop in the city. So anyway, uh, Matt, I think if the laws are in place uh, and how they're enforced is a big, the big question. Thank you. Senator Freitlow. And, and I, too, couldn't, uh, couldn't condone uh, parents serving alcohol to kids underage in, in a party situation. Uh, if, if it's a, you know, a, a couple of 21 or 20-year-olds 20 uh, who are, are at a home and it's, it's like, a, like I said, a private dinner or something like that, that's a lot different than, than one of these so-called key parties, which is just a tragedy waiting to happen. And what a nightmare that would be that you lose a child because somebody else's parent uh, couldn't control, you know, they said they took the keys, but again, we know the nightmare scenarios I know as a, a former journalist what, what that must be like. And that's why we have zero tolerance for minors uh, when it comes to alcohol on the roads and must maintain that. Thank you, everyone. And we're now going to be turning our attention to the issue of mental health. Later in the program, the audience members will have a chance to ask questions, and if you would like to ask some follow-up questions on alcohol, you're welcome to do so. We now, I will now read a statement created by event organizers uh, related to mental health, and then we will begin our question and answer session related to mental health. Mental health disorders have become prevalent in our communities. One in five Wisconsinites will be affected by mental illness this year. However, nearly two-thirds will not get the treatment and support that can help them recover. Failure to receive treatment 
may be the result of multiple factors, including stigma, lack of services, and financial constraints, just to name a few. People can and do recover from mental illness if proper treatment is sought in a timely manner. In 2008, 737 individuals in Wisconsin died by suicide, more than five times as many people that died in our state from homicide. Suicide is preventable and must be addressed as a community in coordination with our other mental health initiatives. We'll now turn to Mark Baldwin for our first question. Nearly 500,000 people in Wisconsin have been uninsured at least part of the past year. At this time, however, Medi Medicaid plans cover very little in terms of mental health services. What are your suggestions for improving access to mental health treatment for those in Wisconsin who cannot afford it? Hey, I want to remind you we'll have 60 seconds to answer the question and we'll begin with Representative Petrowski. You want to repeat the question, Mark? Hmm. Nearly half a million people in Wisconsin have been uninsured, at least at some point in the past year. At this time, however, Medicaid plans cover very little in terms of mental health services. What are your suggestions for improving access to mental health treatment for those in the state who cannot afford it? I think there's more than one problem, and it isn't just being able to afford it. Uh, I think we have probably a lack of counselors and a lack of psychiatrists and all of that that we need to address also. We talk about mental parity. Uh, that on itself probably isn't enough to, to uh, force the insurance companies to pay for different services. This is something that I, I think all elected people deal with because at times we have people calling our office looking for help. Sometimes through the, the county we get involved and uh, you know sometimes they have great results and sometimes they don't. But I don't think there's any easy, access, easy answer to the problem as far as getting more money in to take care of the needs that are actually there. Thank you, Representative Petrowski. We'll now turn to Mr. Punky. Okay, uh, thank you. I think one of the reasons why we have one in five identified right now is because we know how to diagnose much better. That's something that has in improved uh, over the years. And I think along with that diagnosis comes a responsibility as far as trying to treat. Uh, obviously, that, that means priorities in difficult budget years. It's difficult to find those funds in, in order to find treatment for all the people that are in need. I think one area that we can look at is uh, tuition forgiveness for a uh, students uh, graduating from the UW system to make sure we have enough trained professionals in the mental health area so that we can at least overcome the hurdle of accessibility or making sure that we have enough people available uh, to cover the meta, uh, mental health issues. Thank you, Mr. Punky. Mr. Rutherford. Well, uh, from what I see and talking to different people and we can understand one thing about our health care reform that came down is that not a whole lot of people understand it. And I think when we start working these things out with the state, what we're mandated to do as a state, I think that there should be a little bit of money put towards mental health. And like Todd said, there should be more, more actually more psychologist trained, and that was actually what I was going to school for before I had to quit. But the main thing is, I think it's a big, big thing to do with community, too. I mean, you got church groups and e even volunteers from the, uh, from the classes that are going through psychology cl courses and things like that. Anything will help, that's for sure. Thank you. We'll now turn to Senator Kreitlow. Well, it bears noticing uh, in the question that we talk about the, the shortcomings on the Medicaid side, but on the, on the private insurance side, uh, it was no, noteworthy that this legislature uh, did enact and Governor Doyle signed the Mental Health Parity Act that does deal primarily with, obviously, with private health insurance companies, but does take us closer to that goal that uh, we also had at, at the federal level of making sure that we understand that mental health care is, in fact, health care and does deserve coverage because of the high costs, like everything else in healthcare, of not treating it. So we have made steps forward. 
but the question was about Medicaid specifically, and, and nobody can make you any, any uh, big promises here because of the economic state that we're in right now. Uh, that any improvements that we make in mental health coverage through Medicaid are going to be small, they're going to be incremental, but we are going to continue to uh, try our best to push forward and make those positive changes in, in Medicaid coverage. And we're also going to make sure that we don't make the problem worse by cutting things that may be working right now, whether it's making sure we have adequate school counselors or programs in our schools that help kids realize that they're not alone, that there are people that can help them through a tough time. Thank you. Senator Decker. Well, I'm glad Pat mentioned that about the mental health parity bill that we passed. That lingered around for quite a while. And finally, we got it up and got onto the governor's desk. But another bill that we also passed was called the Virginia Tech Bill, where people that want to buy a handgun have to have a background check for mental health. That was a Republican bill that came out of Alberta Darling out of Whitefish Bay. So uh, this has not been a partisan issue. It's been around for quite a while, but we got good bipartisan support in the last session and got it onto the governor's desk. So the other thing I think you need to have with, with mental health is public perception. I think it's something that's coming around slowly, that people are looking at it as a regular physical disorder and not as much as like we used to think back in the past. Thank you, Senator Decker. Representative Seidel. Well, as we've already heard, these economic times are incredibly difficult. The needs are growing, especially, and it's certainly including in the mental health area, and the resources are dwindling. But the good news is people are recognizing the importance that those issues be treated and attended. So, Obviously, more resources would be key. However, I think there are other two components, and we see it right here in this community. One is um, the receipt of Recovery Act money that helped our Bridge Community Clinic expand and add mental health services for the needy. That is great news for here. Secondly, public-private partnerships. I had the great opportunity <coughs> to visit the Community Corner Clubhouse recently, drop-in center where people get help not only from professionals but from one another and community volunteers. And that has done amazing work for a huge number of people across this area. Thank you. Mr. Moss. Well, uh, several people have mentioned that the um, Wisconsin doesn't have any money to spend on new, any new programs. So uh, we're going to have to come up with some innovative um, ideas on how else we can help the mental health programs. Uh, one of them w might be to a uh, charitable choice program where you get a dollar per do for a dollar uh, tax credit for. Um, donations to community and and um, health service organizations, charities, that type of thing, so that uh, it'd be similar to a getting a tax credit for a health savings account. Um, that would be one thing. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, the state legislature didn't uh, pass the uh, medical marijuana. Bill, and so now we've, we're, um, veterans are facing, f facing uh, getting zombified with chemical uh, drugs rather than uh, um, a herbal drug, and uh, 14 states in the United States, they don't have that problem. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Eno. I have uh, been in two situations, one in my family and one in my wife's work where a person committed suicide. I think awareness in the business community is very important and I don't think that there has been much awareness made available to them. Uh, the screening also would be, um, if the employer knew what was taking place, uh, they could refer that person without uh, any reprisal of, of suggesting something like that. Uh, alcohol was a, was a situation in, the, in one of them in my family and the other one was simply one that was more of a family abuse situation that caused, the, uh, that caused it, but it was also a mental problem. I think that education all the way from uh, the beginning stages to uh, through high school and on needs to be done. Uh, screening needs to be done on a regular basis. Uh, we need to make parents aware of what's going on with, within their children, within the educational system. Thank you, panelists. We now like to turn back to uh, Mark Baldwin for a follow-up question. I want to tease out um, uh, 
I want to tease this issue of the, the uh, availability of providers a little bit a little bit more. A couple of you touched on it, um, but I, but I want to uh, hear from the rest of the panel and and maybe uh, have you elaborate a little bit. You know, it's widely acknowledged here, certainly Marathon County, Portage County, um, central part of the state generally, that there is a serious shortage of mental health professionals, particularly psychiatrists, the MDs. Um, you know, in Portage County, there essentially now there are none. They've uh, since Ministry Healthcare, uh, uh, they, or it's very hard to find. There are none, I don't believe anymore, who, who are taking uh, outpatients. Um, that said, what is the state role? What role does the state have in addressing a shortage of providers? Or perhaps to reframe it a little bit, what options do policymakers have? to address a shortage of providers like that. Okay, remind, uh, as a reminder, we have 30 seconds. We'll, let us begin with Mr. Punky, please. I, I believe there are a lot of different options available, and it goes down to creativity. You know, what can we do to uh, make central Wisconsin a more desirable place to live? I had mentioned tuition forgiveness. I think that's something that works in a lot of areas, uh, attracting teachers and other uh, physicians in, into areas. I think that's something we need to explore. And, and perhaps it needs to be greater than just uh, forgiveness of tuition. I don't, I'm not sure what the magic bullet is we need in order to attract people to practice here, but we, there's certainly a need. Thank you. Moving to the right, uh, uh, Representative Petrowski. You know, in so many ways, we, we create incentives for different things, whether it be to get people to invest in cheese-making equipment or to extend uh, creating jobs, whatever. And I think this is just all part of that, uh, the tuition forgiveness, somehow to create some type of incentive that would get people not only to go into that line of work, into that field, but then, in turn, to locate in areas that we need. We've done this with dentists. We've done this with MDs. So I, I think, you know, it's logical to go ahead and say that we, we could be looking at doing this for psychiatrists or for counselors or whatever. Thank you. Mr. Eno. <clears throat> this is truly a specialty field. You have to really have a kind heart for this situation. Uh, Jerry just took my two points that I wrote down here. We do need to provide incentives to incentivize young people to, uh, to take their, their education in this particular area to heart and to really uh, push certain people into those particular uh, types of jobs. Uh, incentive or tuition incentives, absolutely. I think that's imperative that we use some of those methods to do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Moss. Well, I, I can't argue with, uh, with that. I think incentives uh, are a good idea. I'm, um, I'm a little leery about the, the government trying to plug people into certain holes so that they, they fill up all the holes. So I, I think uh, there are a lot of other factors that are involved, but providing uh, some incentives and, and letting the uh, med students pick the best one for them sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Representative Seidel. Well, you know, the legislature has, and I am sure will continue to grapple with this very complicated issue in a number of ways, from discussing opportunities to incentivize students to make med medical education more affordable, to issues concerning scope of practice. But this has already been mentioned. One of the key issues really is making our communities around the state attractive for folks to want to live and work and raise their families. And that becomes a much broader issue, and we have lots of opportunities to try to address that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Decker. Yeah, I, I think Todd Punky uh, mentioned one of them, saying that uh, tuition or loan forgiveness would be one incentive. The other thing is that now that the mental health parity is, is mandated to be covered by insurance policies, I think that will open up some areas that there's going to be more uh, need for practices. Okay, thank you. Senator Kreitlow? And the only other thing I would add to what everybody has said to this point is that it's, it's not just a government hiring a person to be a psychiatrist in an area. That is, as Representative Seidel said, the, where the private partnerships come into play. When Representative Petrosky talked about getting dentists in the rural areas, Marshfield Clinic is one example of a private institution that has been very aggressive in wanting to fill that niche in their marketplace, which is rural Wisconsin. So it's actually some of the clinics and other providers that we can be working with to provide the incentives, not just to individuals, but also to provider entities. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Rutherford. 
The tuition thing that Todd was talking about is a real good deal, but th I think if we get in a worst case scenario like we are now, I in order to take care of maybe two counties at a time or something in that order or hire people, I mean, w we definitely need them, and if there's a shortage, we should definitely help the kids in school, but if you draw, you could draw some people in just by living in this state, I mean, <laughs> I don't mind it, but like I said, I, I think even if we run out of money, I think even two counties can handle one professional, I think. Thank you. We'll now turn to our second question on mental health from Pam Warnke. In 2006, the Bureau of Justice Statistics found that nearly two-thirds of our prison or jail inmates were found to have recent mental health problems. Repeat incarceration is directly related to inmates not getting adequate mental health services. While treatment in a jail setting is critical, studies have also shown that community support programs significantly increase the inmate's successful transition back into the community. What options beyond providing treatment would you propose to assist recently released inmates to um, prevent recidivism? Mr. Rutherford, we'd like to start with you. 60 seconds, please. Well, if you release somebody from prison, you just can't turn them out in the street. I mean, they're going to have to need some kind of training. I think the more people that are involved with that person's life, like your parole officer or some county agent or some kind of educational specialist, or the more, the more opportunity these, these people have so they don't have recidivism is the fact that if they have a job and they, a really de halfway decent job, something they can live on, you know. I mean, it doesn't take long before somebody to go bad. They just give up. I mean, it's, if they're turned down with a job after a job and there's nobody there to help them well, they're just going to definitely go back to the life of crime. Thank you. Um, Senator Kreitlow, 60 seconds. I think one of the best things we can do uh, to assist recently released inmates or those about to be is to stop playing political games with them and to stop uh, using it as a convenient football during election years. We worked on a program called Earned Release of Inmates, where those people who are nearing the time that they've served and would be released anyway have the potential to be out a little bit earlier, to get into treatment a little bit earlier, save the state taxpayers a lot of money, and yet it's been used as a pawn as called early release, which it most certainly is not. These are inmates who have earned that and who need the help that they're going to uh, require in order to become productive and taxpaying members of society again. So we need to end the culture of belittling treatment, that somehow a treatment instead of incarceration uh, program is some type of a welfare or giveaway, when in fact it is an investment in the people of our community, because the option otherwise is in fact to just open the gates and let them out, have a NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard, for where they're located, and watch as they do commit new crimes and don't get the treatment they need. Thank you. Senator Decker, 60 seconds. Yeah, I think it's important to note 70% of our inmates have alcohol or other drug problems, and I think that's something we need to address. Uh, I like what was said down the line about being employee ready when you, when you come out of uh, prison that you can get a decent job. Um, I, I think the other thing to look at is also be a little more proactive and look at the schools, maybe the school nurses or the social workers being better trained to identify people that may have these mental health programs. But one question I would, would, would add to this is that our homeless veterans have a high percentage of, of uh, mental health problems that no, never seems to get addressed even though they served our country. Uh, we're, we're seen to be fixated on people who broke the law rather than the homeless veterans who I think would be another good area that we start to discuss. Thank you. We'll now turn to Representative Seidel. Well, thanks for the question, Pam. It's a great one, and I am happy to talk about the issue of our corrections policies in the state because for way too long, you know, we have been talking about tough on crime. As a result, we incarcerate nearly more than double the numbers of folks in prison in Minnesota close in population, close in crime rate. I believe we ought to start getting smart on crime and look at that whole incarceration policy. But specific to the question, while we do incarcerate so many and nearly 8,000 are released back into our communities each year, we need to look at community reintegration. We're sending these folks out of the prison system with no job, no place to live, no support system, and no resources not too difficult to see that the 
recidivism rate continues to be way too high. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Well, as far as a mental health um, problem, uh, again, I, I favor the charitable choice thing where people can uh, help support charities who are dealing with people who have mental health problems. And I ag agree with uh, Representative Seidel that, uh, that Wisconsinites aren't twice as bad as Min Minnesota residents or, or the people in, that they put in prison. So uh, something's wrong here that, that we're throwing way too many people in, in prison and if they have mental health problems, I don't think that that helps them very much. The thing that we have to remember is all these prisoners, or most of them, are Wisconsin citizens. And so um, we have to think of ways that we can avoid sending them to prison in the first place, some other programs and so, some other options, uh, treatment rather than prison, and then if they do go to prison, uh, how are we going to reintegrate them? Uh, um, they should be ex-felons, not felons for the rest of their life, and they should get their rights back. Thank you. Mr. Eno, 60 seconds. When my father passed away five years ago, uh, we were uh, we used a, a uh, community-based facility for uh, uh, inmates who had been released. Um, they were released into a church-sponsored program uh, within Lincoln, Nebraska, where they were able to get furniture, clothing, everything else for apartments that were provided by the churches. There was incentive there for them to do better. There was incentive on the part of the community to help them find jobs, uh, and it worked very well. And I think we could do the same thing here. We need to provide the ability to train within our institutions, but we also need to bring them back into the community in a, uh, a community-based program that will help them integrate back into community and become ex-felons instead of uh, the felons. We do, need to, we do need to work very hard in this particular area. Thank you, Representative Petrowski. Thank you. I think one of the keys is for early diagnosis and trying to find a way to treat the problems that you know these young people have. Or, uh, in prison, they need to learn skills. They need to get job training. Uh, if you're going to let people out of prison that are not going to have a job, uh, they're probably going to end up back in prison. So I think we need to do more on training. I think uh, with the, in town here, we have the Ratlin homes. They have about five homes where veterans can go, people that were on the street, they can go, and they have duties as being part of living there, you know, whether it be cooking or cleaning or whatever. And I think it's kind of that transitional to get them back into the mainline society, mainstream society, and I think they do a great job here in town at the Ratlin homes. Thank you, and now Mr. Funky. Well, um, whenever someone's getting ready to get released from prison, there are three areas that we need to look at. We need to look at the family. I think the family needs to be involved as far as what the diagnosis is. If there's a mental health issue, I think they need to be aware of it so they know how to deal with it. I think the public sector, meaning the government sector, has to be able to provide the treatment and the services to give that person every opportunity of not being a repeat offender. And then the community, as Chuck talked about, having uh, services available, whether that be through church or other non nonprofit organizations, to be able to follow up with that in individual and make them feel like they're a part of the community and they have something to give as well as something to get. I think each one of us needs to realize that everyone, everyone has something to offer and something to improve people's lives. And we really need to make, uh, put that forth to the people leaving the prison system. Thank you. Pam, would you like to ask a follow-up? Representative Petrowski, you said job training programs. Senator Decker, you said 70% have drug or alcohol problems, possibly indicating that they're medicating mental health issues on their own. I think most of you agreed that more programs need to be in place. So how do those programs get funded, given the fact that we have very tight budgets? Why don't we start with Senator, uh, sorry, uh, Representative Petrowski, and then we'll move to his right. I don't think the funding is going to be any easy choice, especially this time. The state of Wisconsin is looking right now at a $2.6 billion hole. Uh, you can couple that with the $200 million that we're going to have to pay back to the patient's compensation fund. There are some people are saying we're looking at a $3 billion hole. So 
I think it's going to be very tough finding the dollars. I think we're going to try to make sure that we fund the things that are important to society, whether it be ambulance, fire, police service, uh, things that we have an obligation to do, taking care of the poor, the needy, the elderly, and the veterans. I think we need to go at the programs we have to make sure that they are doing what they're supposed to do. And I think you take it on a step-by-step -step basis to see where we indeed can save ourselves some money, we'll find out which programs are working, and which ones aren't. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eno. I am my brother's keeper. And I am responsible to help him wherever I possibly can. The state of Michigan took over the Sawyer Air Force Base in the Upper Peninsula and is using it as a dumping ground for people who have drug problems, mental problems, um, who have been in jail and have gotten out and have no place to go. My church, along with other churches in this community, have taken on the project of working with the, uh, a small church in, at Sawyer Air Force Base and are providing them with food and clothes and are in the process of trying to help them with jobs or, or the opportunity of creating jobs up there. I think we need to do that in other areas, uh, in, right here even in Wausau. Rabbin Homes is good, but. Thank you, Mr. Eno. Mr. Moss? Um, well, I think, I think we have to uh, recognize the limitations of government and move away from the the idea that the government's going to solve all our problems and we just have to advocate and, and lobby a little harder for our, our special interests. Uh, and we're going to have to t uh, take on some of these responsibilities ourselves, either as individuals or church groups or other uh, community organizations supporting Randland House. Um, I mentioned the, the, uh, the charitable choice idea and um, um, we, we have to do it ourselves. Thank you. Representative Seidel. Well, keeping community safety as the priority factor in determining who would be in our prison system should, you know, obviously be um, our top concern. But once we do that, I, again, I would like us to relook at our incarceration policies and see if there are some individuals in the system housed at the cost to taxpayers of about $35,000 a year who could be better served in an outside of prison program. A long range um, recommendation and something that I have been working on is to remove the 17 year olds from the adult system. Once a juvenile gets involved in the adult system, it's pretty hard to extract them from it. And I think that while the return on investment is not immediate, it could be substantial both in quality of life and taxpayers' money. Thank you. Senator Decker. Well, I think this is pretty well summed up, Eric. Uh, um, Jerry Petrowski talked about the financial problems we have, and I've been telling folks, if you, got what you, if you get what you had the last budget, consider that the new raise because uh, the, the Federal Recovery Act money backfilled a lot of holes, not only in ed education, but in transportation, uh, K K-12, tech colleges, and universities. So uh, I think it's gonna be very difficult. I think we're gonna be faced with a situation that we have to balance the budget that's constitutionally mandated to us as legislators, and then we're gonna have a hard time. So we're just gonna have to pull the pieces together. And I, I still like to go back, I think we need to head it off at the pass and try to get some of this early identification before they commit crimes. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kreitlow. And, and while Senator Decker is right about, uh, you know, it, it's going to be darn tough, there, there are no couch cushions anymore to look underneath to find new monies for programs, so you have to find efficiencies in existing programs. As we outlined with earned release for corrections, or in the case of Medicaid, going to the Medicaid Rate Reform Project, which again, instead of just uh, taking a chainsaw to the Medicaid budget like my opponent wants to do with a, an across-the-board cut, we in fact found ways to make uh, lesser <coughs> cuts in vulnerable areas by making deeper cuts in others that could handle that by renegotiating contracts, by paying for quality of outcomes rather than quantity of procedures that you do. These are the types of smart things you can do in any health care, mental health care program, those efficiencies that are going to help you pay to expand program offerings to a, a vulnerable population. Thank you. Mr. Rutherford. Well, the, the budget is definitely a problem. And as this fellow right over here told, was talking about, I, my brother-in-law and 
some of his church groups, they work with these people right, right in prison before they do get out. And I think it's gonna be a community deal. It almost have to be. And there can be more money later on down the road, but right now it's gonna be really tough. Thank you, and finally, Mr. Punky. As everyone has echoed, the difficulty of the budget year facing us, I think we have to look for creative approaches and creative ideas. I think one is perhaps being able to partner with businesses that are looking for specific uh, skills for their jobs, and pr perhaps they can partner with us in our prisons and teach those jobs and those skills to those inmates and those individuals so when they come out, there's something ready and waiting for them. Thank you very much to the panelists. We'll now be turning to the topic of tobacco use. And I'll first read a statement that was created by event organizers on this topic. Wisconsin has made some significant gains against exposure to tobacco-related diseases. The smoke-free air law enacted on July 5th will go a long way in reducing non-smoker exposure to secondhand smoke and prevent related diseases. Wisconsin-funded tobacco prevention and control programs have proven successful at reducing other tobacco problems. Funding for tobacco prevention and control has a significant return on investment as every $1 spent on tobacco prevention has been shown to generate $3.60 in healthcare savings. These savings have been realized by individuals and by Wisconsin's businesses. Since, 2000, since 2001, teen smoking has dropped 46%, adult smoking is down two thousand, uh, sorry, 21%, and more than 150,000 lives have been changed by the quit line services. However, tobacco is still the number one cause of preventable death in Wisconsin, and more needs to be done. For our first question on tobacco, we will be turning to Matt Lehman. Wisconsin's tobacco prevention efforts have helped to keep youth smoking on the decline, uh, but unfortunately these efforts have been hampered by recent funding cuts, and in fact the gains may be short-lived. I mean, we look to neighboring states and other states in the country where they've actually seen increased smoking rates uh, following a reduction of funding like ours. Um, as Eric mentioned in his opening statement, the funding, check that, the return on investment by preventing teen smoking is high as it improves public health into the future. So what is your position regarding investment on tobacco prevention and control? We'd like to begin uh, by asking Representative Seidel to take the first crack at this question. You have 60 seconds. Well, clearly, if, if there were adequate revenues in the state of Wisconsin, <coughs> these smoking cessation programs and education would get much more support. But the reality is, as Russ discussed in the last answer, is we're looking at a $2.7 billion deficit, and it likely could be higher. So it's going to be very, very tough to see increased funding. I would hope, once again, to rely on some public private partnerships to continue spreading the word about the value of non-smoking. The lives saved, the money saved. The, certainly one of the things that I will very carefully guard is keeping our statewide smoking ban in place. And I think there are people at this table today who are talking about asking for people's votes so they can go to Madison and repeal that. I think that would be a horrendous mistake. Thank you. Mr. Moss. Well, um, libertarians are in favor of uh, persuasion. And what persuaded me not to smoke was uh, when my dad quit smoking uh, cold turkey, he put a, uh, an opened pack of unfiltered camels in the dresser drawer. So when I was about 16 years old, I, I knew they were there. I thought, well, I don't have to buy them. They're right here. So I took them out and um, <coughs> unfiltered 15-year-old <laughs> camel cigarettes are really nasty. So I recommend that the state provide every kid with a, <laughs> a pack of camels. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I think, well, if teen smoking is down 46%, something, something must be working. So I think we got to keep doing what we're doing. Um, and um, I, uh, I, I'm right behind uh, any efforts for education and persuasion rather than force. Thank you. Mr. Eno. When I was a kid, 
the first thing I smoked was a Swisher's Sweets. I don't know if any of you know what that is. It was a cigar, and it was very sweet. And I got so sick that I didn't smoke again until a friend of mine in the back door came over with a package of camels. He says, let's try them. And I tried them, and my dad caught us. And he made us smoke the whole pack right there in front of him, and we were so sick. I don't advocate that, but it is a good point that if you, in education, if you show the kids how bad and how black the lungs are after they smoke or after they've been smoking for a while, and what it leads to, I think our kids are smart enough to realize that you just shouldn't smoke. Thank you. Representative Petrowski. Thank you. It's probably going to take me longer than 50 seconds. You can have mine. <laughs> um, November 5th is going to be 36 years since I've smoked. And I used to smoke Paul Mall no filter. <laughs> At the time, I thought they were good. But uh, I'll tell you, when my son was born, my wife asked me to quit, and I quit smoking. As I look around, I think of my dad's family. They basically all smoked except one and most of them died young. I had one uncle that lived till he was 93. He didn't smoke. Last spring, I had two friends in February that died because of throat cancer. I think kids need to see that. I speak to a lot of young people, and I explain to them what some of these people have gone through just because of these cigarettes, and it isn't only just that. Many of you are probably as old as I am but you look back at the kids that you went to school with and you run into them, and the ones that smoke really look like they're really tough shape, like they've aged twice what they should have. And I think knowing things like that is really important, that education part that, you know, whether it be the, uh, the control board or whatever, I think plays a unique role. I think there are two other things that make a big difference. One, uh, the cost of smoking has gone up dramatically. Uh, I think that has a big effect, and uh, the enforcement efforts by law enforcement to keep uh, young people from buying these cigarettes has helped also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Punky. I think it's powerful to hear these stories. Everyone's been able to share stories they had when they were growing up and why they smoked or why they didn't smoke. I'll share mine as well. Uh, <laughs> when I was uh, 19 years old, my uh, grandmother passed away. She had a quarter of a lung and had uh, emphysema. And she was bright, extremely sharp, and I think of all the things that she had left to, to live for and be a part of, and that was robbed for from her. So as a result, uh, that kept me away from it. I think one of the things that we have to realize is that prevention pays off big time. And any dollars we spend in prevention uh, pay dividends for us down the road. So we really need to uh, continue to make that a priority and to invest in uh, preventing uh, people from smoking. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rutherford. When they raised the taxes the last time on cigarettes, the first year they lost over $90 million on the old rate, not counting the new rate. And what bothered me the most was, since I am a smoker, they took away all the, any alternatives you had to, you know, you, the helplines and stuff like that. Well, it costs more than just calling up a phone and figuring, well, you're cured now. It, it takes drugs and, you know, it, it as far as I'm concerned, when the, when the taxes are higher than the neighboring state, people are going to go to the neighboring state. We got three states neighboring this state alone. So you go in 100 miles, I guarantee you anybody that smokes is going to go across the border. I guarantee you if you drop this cigarette taxes down to where it is, the highest of a neighboring state, you'll actually increase your revenue from taxes. and less than 1% of what I pay for taxes isn't enough, and it isn't fair to the people that are smoking and paying, paying these taxes, so. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kreitlow. I first want to tip my hat to the FACT group, the, uh, the teenagers uh, from all the various schools that have come down to Madison or lobbied us locally. Uh, they have proven that, again, message is a big part of this, public education and we need to continue supporting any public health and education resources that go to that kind of peer-to-peer -peer education to help control tobacco use. But the other way is to go in completely the opposite of direction of what you just heard. 
being married to a primary care physician, uh, I'll echo her statements. You know, patches are, are fine, they're okay. The helpline, th that's nice. But what gets more of her patients to quit than anything else is every time that cigarette tax goes up or that tobacco tax, then people say, okay, enough of this. That's my hard-earned money going to it. That's my health at stake. I'm done. Now, I'm not advocating any kind of a big increase because then it does indeed have the black market effect or the running across the border effect. But with each annual small increase, as it gets publicized and as people caterwaul about it, it also gets people saying, you know what, that's enough of this. And when there's less of it available, fewer youths have the opportunity to try it out of their parents' desk drawer as well. Thank you. Senator Decker. Well, you know, given the budget restraints we have, we'll do what we can, but we started the prevention program back in 2001 with good support from Republicans and Democrats. And the smoking ban that took effect was uh, good support from uh, Republicans and Democrats as well. But I think we need to also be straight up with this. Everybody in this room and everybody outside this room knows that smoking is bad for you. Some of the folks down at the end of the table talked about their history. My dad used to blame it on the paper that was around the cigarettes, not on the tobacco. But companies have started wellness programs, and I think all those peer pressures that Pat talked about. But one of the irony that I think in this campaign is the lady that's running against me is a doctor, and she wants to repeal the smoking ban. And I think that is just an incredible, incredible statement to make that a physician, most of the physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals were on our backs as long uh, along with the Cancer Society, to do a smoking ban. We got a compromise put together that passed the Assembly in the Senate and was signed into law, but I find it really ironic that a, a candidate who is a physician is out there saying she wants to repeal the smoking ban. Thank you. We'll now turn back to Matt Lehman for a follow-up question. I'm going to try to piece this together <coughs> as best I can here. There's a lot of uh, different things that I want to ask about. Uh, we've talked about the funding issue. A lot of you mentioned that because there's a, a state budget deficit, it's hard to put money into these tobacco uh, prevention and control programs. As some of you also talked about the cigarette tax that we know it's one of the highest in the country, in fact, uh, with the last rate increase that just took effect here. I, I want to ask this question here. We have a gas tax that's supposed to be used to help improve our roads. Is it possible to use a cigarette tax uh, to go solely kind of dedicated uh, fund, if you will, uh, to pay for this tobacco prevention and control? Is that something that the legislature should consider? We'll begin answering this question by starting with um, Senator Decker. You could do that, Matt, but let me point out when senior care was started back in, in 1999, that was when Thompson, uh, Tommy Thompson was governor, and the cigarette tax went up 18 cents a pack to pay for senior care so we could cover the cost of prescription drugs for those that couldn't afford to pay for it. So if you dedicate it, then all of a sudden you've got a big hole that we have to try and plug up the senior care program because that's where that cash is flowing to. So I think that is more important that we take care of prescription drugs uh, with, with the uh, cigarette tax that was generated you know, when that bill passed. Thank you. We'd like to go to the right now and Senator Kreitlow. Uh, and, and this is, I guess, more of a, a process question about budgets and, and how many silos do you create? Is there a silo just for cigarette tax revenue, gas tax revenue? We could have talked about you know, beer tax revenue during that. And, and, and there's a, a case to be made either way, that, that funds going into a particular pot should be used only in that particular area. But let's remember that the state's general fund, the GPR dollars, if you will, uh, also go in many different directions that, that may address a particular issue. And not everybody who smokes is on Medicaid. And yet every one of us through our tax dollars is paying for millions and millions and millions of dollars to pay for health care costs related to smoking. So you, you could make the argument uh, to, to use the funds in that direction, but I'd make note that uh, the, the state's general fund pays for a lot of things related to uh, smoking and, and related uh, topics. Thank you. Mr. Rutherford. I'd have to just repeat what I said. I mean, they should be able to take at least one percent or whatever it takes to help the people that are still smoking quit because I'll tell you I mean just taxing them isn't going to do it I mean I've been smoking a long time and I, I can guarantee you that I would love to quit but as the times are going here I don't know thank you Mr. Punky I, I believe we need to have a commitment to where that money comes from but I don't think it should be ironclad I think that that's something that we just have to look at priorities and we have to look at the uh, GPR. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Representative Petrowski. Um, Matt, I think you can do it. Whether 
you're going to get enough people to agree to do it is another situation. You know, there's 130 people that that work on these issues all the time, but they have to come to an agreement that uh, you know, face it, budgets a lot of times are compromises. Thank you, Mr. Eno. The um, I don't know the exact name of it, the commission, but the Fiscal Legislative Bureau put out a eight or seven or eight page report on the funds that were given away to organizations that are outside of government that I think we could take a look at making some changes in those particular areas and limiting the scope of government as to where the, they spend the money. Uh, as far as smoking is concerned, I've said my say, it's wrong, it's bad, it makes you sick. Just all you gotta do is look at it. Let's get back into the education for our young people. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Well, uh, I don't have any, uh, any insights other than what the incumbents have uh, mentioned as far as the funding thing, so I'll, uh, I'll <coughs> get a little bit off the topic, uh, although uh, we're talking about investment and prevention and control, and I think the one thing that really bothers me about the workplace smoking ban was that it was even applied to the King Veterans Home and the amendment which would have exempted the, the separated ventilated uh, smoking lounge for the veterans, which would, would, and they didn't bother anybody else, it would have to be closed. And so now we have elderly citizens living out the end of their life, um, forced to go outside in the Wisconsin winter and summer, and I don't think that that's a, a healthy way to live. Thank you, Representative Seidel. Well, we're circling back to something we talked about right from the beginning, and that is we're having growing needs in our population and less revenue to take care of those needs. But one of the things that we may talk about further here also could be a bit of an asset to us, and that is the smokeless tobacco products. The tobacco industry has been very, very clever in figuring out how to create and market new products, not cigarettes, but deliver the tar, the nicotine that cigarettes do. I think we can look at the taxing structure for those products that are increasingly attractive to young people and increasingly or more dangerous than cigarettes that they've been smoking. Thank you. And for our second question on tobacco, we'll return to Mark Baldwin. It's funny you should mention that. <laughs> um, because another layer of this issue is smokeless tobacco products. Um, which are on the rise, the use is on the rise among young people uh, in Wisconsin. And the industry has, as you point out, rather cleverly uh, branched out to appeal to children. Even though tobacco can be purchased legally only by those 18 years or older, the industry has introduced flavors such as chocolate, vanilla, mint, dreamsicle, wild berry, and watermelon into its tobacco products. What is your, each of you, like just to talk for a, for a minute about your take on the marketing, how, what, what you think about the marketing and sale of these products here in Wisconsin? Thank you. Let's begin with Mr. Eno and then we'll move to his right. Well, I don't think that you, you can do too much about their marketing efforts because then you're, you're imposing government onto business and I'm not in favor of that at all. I think it still goes back to education. Uh, we need to make sure that the young people know that what they're getting is not what they're getting, it's just a taste, and what they're getting is really bad for them. I, 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 I just don't see what you can do about that marketing approach unless you're going to try and enforce government rules on the private business. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Well, um, Libertarians would agree with that uh, pretty much, and uh, and there's probably not a lot in the uh, health education curriculum yet about um, uh, chewing tobacco. Uh, at least I'm not familiar with it, and so I think uh, uh, our educators have to be brought up to speed on, on that. And I agree that the, the marketing aspect is is protected as freedom of speech, so we aren't going to be able to eliminate their 
freedom of speech just because we don't agree with the, what they're selling. Thank you, Representative Seidel. It's, it's an interesting question. Last year I had someone come in my office and dumped on my desk samples of some of these smoke-free products that are out there and available to our kids. It is appalling and shocking and disgusting. And the danger that these products have um, are, is incredible. So I, I really feel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I suspect, I um, am expecting that in the next legislative session we will have many opportunities to talk about public policy in Wisconsin to address this issue. Thank you, Senator Decker. That's how Decker. I really feel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Decker. Well, I was going to ask Mark a question, but between chocolate, vanilla, mint, or dream cycle, wild berry, or watermelon, what's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Watermelon flavored tobacco. <laughs> That'll be <Take> okay. away. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's been pretty much some, unless it's specifically banned, I don't know how you would uh, stop people from promoting it because, you know, even if we tried in Wisconsin, you still have the Interstate Commerce Clause, which prohibits us from doing a lot of things because every state cannot be an island. We have to be somewhat of a unified nation on that type of thing. So, I think there's basic rules and rights of some companies, even if you don't find it objectionable that they have that right. So the peer pressure is a big thing. And a lot of people talked about the different tobaccos. And there's another question come up that I'll, I'll answer later. But I used to chew Red Man when I played softball. And, and after about a year of that, I finally realized, that, hey, this is not good for you. Now, he said, it tastes not too bad, but it's really hard on your stomach and your gums and even your throat. So I jettisoned that pretty quickly. Thank you. Senator Kreitlow. I actually would come back to, to my previous answer on the two things. One would be, uh, how do you match uh, marketing. You, you match it with uh, counter marketing, which comes back to public education, public health, the fact group, everything else that we can possibly try to assist, uh, hopefully with a lot of help from uh, private groups that are uh, that have this as an aim of theirs to reduce uh, smokeless tobacco use because, again, we are dealing with a federally regulated and, and licensed product and really one of the only other tools in, in a state toolkit is the taxation end of it is to say, you know, we can't stop you from it, but here's the user fee because I, as a non-tobacco user, shouldn't have to pay for you when you make this bad decision and you're eventually gonna need much more health care than you can afford. So you help pay for this through uh, that user fee of, of a tobacco tax on cigarettes or smokeless tobacco or whatnot. And again, making sure that it's, it's a level that doesn't drive some type of a black market situation, but also doesn't uh, you know, excuse the user from making sure they pay closer to their, ver their fair share of what that bad decision is gonna cost the rest of us. Mr. Rutherford. I don't think you can stop the marketing is per se. I think the access to it, they, I've seen some of these products and they're not behind the counter like they should be. I think they should be behind the counter along with cigarettes then carded if they're gonna buy it. Thank you, Mr. Punky. Uh, something that I would like to see is I'd like to in see increased taxation on those flavors. If uh, you have specific flavors, uh, then you go ahead and increase the tax amount on it. I think we need to look at uh, nicotine delivery systems as well and not just call it cigarettes, uh, smokeless tobacco, and cigars because there are a lot of different ways that the nicotine can, can get delivered. Uh, I think keeping in mind that we want people to learn how to, how to quit and so we don't tax the patches. Uh, we want to encourage people to quit any way we can. Thank um, you. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Sure. Okay. Thank you, and uh, we'll now turn to Representative Petrowski. I, I'm not sure that you can find a way to restrict them from advertising, or advertising I think you can, but from selling it for access and whatever. But I think you have to go ahead and, and uh, go through the line of enforcement against young people. I'm uh, somewhat annoyed. I have never seen bubble gum chewing tobacco or mint. Mint they had, but uh, not chocolate and watermelon and all that. Uh, I think it's annoying that they want to specifically target children. Okay, thank you. That concludes our panel question portion of the event, and we'd now like to turn some time over to the audience for audience questions. We will have some microphones that will be circulating around <coughs> the auditorium, and some young men and women will be helping with that. So if you have a question, we'd like you to raise your hand. I do want to uh, mention a couple of ground rules on the questions. First, we'd uh, prefer that you only ask questions and avoid statements or any form of political grandstanding. 
and we will be cutting you off if, unless you have a question to ask. So thank you, and we'll now turn it over to the audience. Perhaps this will have to be a community or a church-based operation for reintegration, and I would like to see if there could indeed be um, a county government opportunity to look at the possibility of having treatment inside the jail system. And we already have a captive audience, and there are extensive uh, programs that are available electronically. Therefore, all we would need would be televisions to educate the 8,000 8, people that are released in an attempt to get them some treatment before they're released onto the streets. Could anyone speak to that possibility? Thank you, and rather than have me call on specific panelists, I'd just like to turn it over to the panel. Would anyone like to start with that? Well, let me um, respond by saying that I think there is more serious attention given to prevention and treatment programs. And within the, the um, OWI drunk driving bill that we passed in the last legislative session, there were prevention measures. One was a model program used in Winnebago County that has been expanded statewide. It is now being taken advantage of and will be utilized in the Marathon County judicial system. And that will mean that there will be increased quality treatment for offenders with AODA particularly alcohol issues. These people will be assessed. They will be um, steered into a treatment program most appropriate for their means. And significantly, they will exchange jail time for their commitment to be in that treatment program. So to me, that is a really good sign that we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Would anybody else like to respond? I would just can we can we have uh, Representative Petrowski no. and we'll Senator no. <laughs> <laughs> He actually raised his hand. <laughs> I want to go back and talk about Russ's usage of red man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still got a bag right next to those camels. <laughs> anyway, I know that there are a lot of, of ministers and priests that do work in the jail. And I know one minister that goes there a lot and he works with people that have uh, you know drug problems. Uh, to expand on that, I think you need more help. Maybe there's a program that you talked about that could be utilized, but I think the door is open to help to look at that. Senator Decker? Yeah, I just want to follow up what Donna said. You know, the issue was the Winnebago program, we started as a pilot five years ago, I'd say, and I th we had good support from Republicans as well as Democrats. But it really said, if you go in for treatment versus penalties, and that was the incentive that I think got some, peop some uh, recidivism and repeat drunk drivers off. Anyone else like to respond? Mr. Rutherford? It's the first time I ever heard of this program you're talking about, and I'm usually pretty up on things, and it sounds like it'll work, but with prison system like that, like, to get these people to where they're, you know, segregated, I think, would help a lot. Yeah, the, away from the rest of the population before they do go out. Okay, hearing no others, we'll go to another question. I have a question about beer, specifically the beer tax. Um, and uh, the, I know that the beer tax hasn't been raised in over 40 years. And uh, the majority of people in Wisconsin, adults in Wisconsin, do support a raise in the beer tax. Has anybody on this panel uh, considered raising the beer tax? Does anyone like to take a stab at that? <laughs> as soon as they raised cigarette taxes, it came to mind. Uh, libertarians think that Wisconsin is taxed enough already. We're number 13 in the state and local taxes in the, in the nation. And, uh, and uh, part of our economy depends on healthy businesses. And we've got some businesses that are, we've got hospitality business and brewing business. And um, I wouldn't want to further damage those businesses. Thank you. Any other responses by the panel? OK, 
Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to another question. Regarding uh, marketing, uh, in, in it came up in uh, response to the question about smokeless tobacco. Um, as a general rule, commercial speech is entitled to less protection under the First Amendment than political speech or news content. And so that's one reason, for example, why you don't see cigarette advertising on television. And ju I just wanted to clarify that because I think there was some, maybe some confusion out there. Thank you, Mark. I wanted to um, direct our attention back to tobacco and um, realizing that the tobacco companies are uh, quite clever. They have come up with some new products you might see in the hallway as you, as you either came or as you leave. And those other tobacco products are dissolvable um, products, not necessarily smoking products. Um, and those are the flavored varieties. And my question is, uh, there seems to be, uh, well, there is a, a disparity between, now we've raised the, the taxes on cigarettes, so, and as many of you have said, that's a, a real deterrent. And uh, so now people, are, especially young people, are turning their attention to the other tobacco products. And um, is there any thought that we might raise the tobacco or raise the tax on these other tobacco products to match the cigarette taxes to deter people from also um, buying those and I wonder if I could ask that of uh, Russ Decker please yeah. well we <laughs> there you got I'm, it I'm sorry your answer was wrong uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's off the hook fire alarm <laughs> How'd you do that? Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> well, there was a big change in the last go-around. Uh, smokeless tobacco used to be taxed based on weight, and some of the cheaper brands didn't weigh much, and especially these little packets that you like, that's pretty popular with kids. So we went to a, a, a ad valorem or retail base. So that change has been around. The Cancer Society supported that uh, wholeheartedly, and we kind of leveled the playing field because the cheaper brands uh, now will not be as attractive. Yes, Mr. Punky. Um, Dot, I think that's you. I think one of the things that uh, I mentioned before is the nicotine delivery systems. And instead of just talking about cigarettes or specific products, let's talk about the delivery systems and taxing those. Because we've got to stay a step ahead of the creative minds in the tobacco industry. Can I um, yes, just please. kind of veer off track? As Russ noted, I have pretty strong feelings about these products. Um, the other thing about not only the taxation piece of this, but I think it's a really insidious product, and it's critically important that we educate uh, parents and folks, adults that deal with young people, because it's not like controlling smoking of teenagers who are not gonna pull out a cigarette in the classroom. But these products are usable and not detectable and very difficult to know if your kids have them or are using them. So I think there is even more urgency to spread the word about the availability of these products and the danger of them. Thank you, would any other panelists like to respond? Yes, Mr. Moss. Uh, the focus of the panel is on uh, living longer and about tobacco and alcohol. Um, and those, those two uh, products are among the, uh, the biggest health problems there are, but uh, um, let's see, the statistics I have is deaths per year, tobacco 435,000, alcohol 85,000, uh, illegal drugs, heroin 400, cocaine 200, marijuana zero, uh, but the, the deaths and the health problems from uh, prescription drugs is, is pretty big and it's really growing. And there are some areas in Wisconsin where there have been a lot of uh, uh, health problems and death from the use of or misuse of prescription drugs. So I think that's something we have to keep an eye on also. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel? Do we have any more audience questions? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I, I wanted to ask uh, you to speak to the ethics of businesses that keep coming up with products that we know are bad for us and um, how this, it seems like we are supporting businesses more than we are supporting individual citizens and their need to be or want to be healthy. So I'd like to, to where, does the, where is the line? You know, if it was liquid cyanide, would they be able to sell it too? Would anyone like to answer that question? Well, I think, I don't think it's up to the government to decide. It's up to the individuals to, to decide if they're adults. Uh, libertarians would say they own their own body. They can put whatever they want into it. And we can, we can um, use persuasion and education to help them make good choices, but ultimately it's up to the individual. Thank you. We have Senator Kreitlow and then Mr. Eno. I, I don't mean to pick a fight on the panel here, but I, I can only hear that so many times, especially in every election year, because then we end up saying, well, libertarians believe that we can persuade people that it's in their own best interest to stop at the intersection, and government shouldn't tell people, you know, which car should go first or where the stop sign should go. In fact, we the people are our government, and we decide uh, that it's in the public interest that certain things, you know, should or should not be able to happen. The First Amendment does not grant a blanket right of free speech. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, hate speech, things like that. The same goes for the reason that you don't see smoking ads for cigarette ads anymore, is that this public has decided that while it is a legal product, it should not be mass marketed. So while we at the state level have very little say, uh, say in advancing this particular question, on targeting those companies. I think it's only right and good that we continue to target either our federal elected officials or you know, the, the Food and Drug Administration or anybody that we have to, to get the message out that at the federal level, this is what we want. Whether we're Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Independents, Tea Party, you name it, there are people in every one of those groups that say that, that these things are bad, they are wrong, they are killing our children and our loved ones, and what is a reasonable set of rules and restrictions on certain products, especially ones that aim at our children. Thank you, Mr. Eno. Where do you stop? Where do you stop with regulations? The cars kill more people than this does. Trucks, automobiles. Where do we stop? Let's take them off the market then. I don't think that we can start down that road of regulation we already have. We've gone too far as it is. I agree with my friend here. When government gets to the point where it is big enough that it can control you, it can take everything that you have. And we don't need to proceed down that road any further. We've got to stop and take a look at where we're at. Regulations are fine in certain areas, but where do you stop? Thank you. Any other responses from the candidate panel? Yes? I think the real difference is when you look at flavored tobacco, bubble gum, watermelon, I don't see them making that product for somebody that's 30 years old. They're making that problem to entice young people to use it. And I think that's the problem. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. By a show of hands, would you um, let us know whether you are, are uh, if, if repealing the tobacco tax came up in, during the legislature, if you would vote for that? Could you restate that question? Restate. Could you restate it? Okay. You would like, you'd like Maybe I wasn't clear. Okay. Um, if, by a show of hands, I would like to know if if repealing the tobacco tax comes up in the next session, would you vote for it? The entire tax? The tax or the ban? The, the ban, I'm sorry, the ban. Oh, the smoking ban. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, the statewide smoking ban. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you, oh. Donna. So by a show of hands, if you wouldn't mind, if, if the uh, opportunity comes up to repeal the smoking <coughs> ban, would you repeal that in the next legislative session if you're elected? By show of hands. Thank you. Would anybody like to respond at all? Well, I think the taverns, I think I would, I would vote for them having the right 
if they wanted to have a smoking room or something in that order. Because this probably ain't going to go over, go away overnight. It took how many years just to get us to 20 percent? So. Okay, Senator Decker. Uh, let me point out that you can't have a, a facility or a room as long as it doesn't have cross sections or cross ventilations of air conditioning or heating. You can have kind of like a three season porch outside your facility. Businesses can do it, a tavern can do it, a restaurant can do it. Uh, I did want to circle back on one thing and point out again, the physician that's running against me is for repealing the smoking ban. But she's also against any government mandate on insurance companies and all the strides that we made in, ch in covering children that have autism. My opponent wants to repeal that. She's even opposed to stem cell research, which is probably one of the biggest things that has happened in the state of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, when Dr. Thompson discovered that in the late 90s. I mean, to put not only the University of Wisconsin on the map in this country, it made us worldwide un known university. And my opponent, who's a physician, wants to repeal that. So I think it's incredible some of the, uh, the questions and some of the stances that people running for office in the 29th Senate District this go around are making. I think it's just unconscionable <coughs> after all the things that we're going to do with stem cell, whether it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or heart disease or spinal injuries. I mean, the, the research is incredible and we have opportunity. And why would a physician want to repeal those type of things? Thank you. I think we have time for one more audience question. Back to the, um, the beer tax issue a little bit, but with a, a slightly different twist to it. Um, when we are discussing the tobacco issue, there's been quite a bit of conversation around flavored tobaccos, putting all the different flavors in. Uh, when we look at the beer tax issue, um, there really hasn't been any discussion at all about the alcohol products, which actually are malt beverages or beer that are targeted toward our young people. When we look at increasing the beer tax, um, it is a suggested or proven strategy for reducing underage drinking because our youngest members who are consuming alcohol, their pocketbooks are hit the hardest by some of those beer taxes. Our beer tax has not been raised in 40 years. While we may be the, I believe you said, the 13th highest tax state, um, we are the third lowest in terms of beer tax. So we definitely, um, those two numbers don't necessarily match up. Again, you have the malt beverages that target our young people. Water, all the flavors you listed um, pretty much earlier pertaining to tobacco, those are out there. Elko pops is another term you may have heard them called. Um, because they target, all those flavors target young people. So given that information, um, I'm curious how many of you would consider looking at the issue of increasing our beer tax so that some of that funding might go to prevention and treatment. A lot of discussion was made this evening about education. I mean, continually, and I believe that, um, that Mr. Kreitlow said um, that many of these other issues go back toward, you know, maybe their fu the funding or the, the resources for it are provided out of other areas. You've suggested education repeatedly as one of those areas. As a teacher and a counselor in a public school, um, you know, I'm just curious where you, where you stand in regard to that. Maybe increasing a tax so that we can put some of that money toward prevention and education. Well, I'll start to having, having talked about yeah, the, uh, the integrity of the budget process and whether you wall off certain segregated funds. And we know there's, there are all these referendum questions around the state on the transportation fund and uh, uh, protecting that from that money being used in other places. Uh, the problem with uh, suggesting an increase in the beer tax is that there is also that public perception that, well, you're going to increase how much it costs me to get a six pack and that money isn't going to go toward the areas for which it's intended. Uh, so I was one of the lead authors of a, of a constitutional amendment that would protect, protect segregated funds because once you provide some integrity to certain key funds, then the public may feel more comfortable knowing that if they're asked to pay another two pennies for, for a tap beer or something, that that money will go to that particular area. But to simply say, just increase the beer tax now and take it on faith the money will be used there. It doesn't matter if there's a D or an R next to any politician's name. The last thing that any incumbent wants to do is write their opponent's literature for them. And everybody here could already see what that 
jumbo, you get those big postcards in the mail, you think they're getting bigger, they'll get to be this size eventually. That'll say, you know, Senator so-and-so increased the taxes on this, increased the tax on this, he even increased the tax on your beer. And the last thing that you want to do is try to solve a problem by something that can be easily undone. Remember what FDR did when he first got into office in the early days of, of the Great Depression. One of the first things he did was, was to um, repeal prohibition and say, times are tough, let these guys get a drink. And so for us to say, well, and by us I mean all incumbents, even, even if they all did come together and say, all right, we're gonna increase the, uh, the beer tax, uh, you know, two cents per whatever bottle or whatever, it'd be so easy for an opponent to come in and say, not only am I gonna roll back that two cents, we're gonna cut it three cents or four cents. And then you've done, undone all the progress that you've made. So in, in finally, in, in closing, I, I wanna say it this way. For those folks who are really looking to see that as a possible solution, you're going to have to make the case that that is not political suicide for any incumbent. Much like the smoking ban took year after year after year for politicians to get the message, yes, the majority of the public really is behind them and will back them on election day. A whole lot of politicians have to feel the same way about something as sensitive as taxing somebody's glass of beer. That that really is what people want and that they really will disregard those giant postcards when they come a year or two later. Thank you. Do we have any other responses by panelists? I just, um, I would have hoped that it wouldn't take a constitutional amendment to, to get the legislature not to take from segregated funds and, oops, and move it into the, uh, the general fund. Um, and I'm a little bit s skeptical about constitutional amendments because we've got a, a constitution that says the budget must be balanced and it's not balanced. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope that, that either the constitutional amendment or the legislators themselves will uh, leave the segregated funds alone. Can I just clarify, just to say it's not just for the legislators, but it also, would, what we're trying to do is it's the governor who actually writes the budget. And so that, that's part of the reason behind it as well is uh, it's not just tying the hands of legislatures, but to make sure that future governors would know that these are the rules of the road that, that we the people want our government to follow. Okay, without hearing anybody else response uh, here, I think we uh, need to conclude our event tonight. We're approaching the six o'clock hour and I'd like to just remind you that uh, immediately following this event, uh, if you'll exit the theater and go to the right to uh, what's known as the Terrace Room, there'll be some lemonade, cookies, and opportunities to continue to discuss these issues uh, with audience members and perhaps some candidates. And we'd like to thank the UW Marathon County Dean Sandy Smith for hosting the event, the Marathon County Alcohol and Other Drug Partnership Council, the Central Wisconsin Tobacco Free Coalition, the Marathon County Suicide Prevention Task Force for their sponsorship of this conference. We'd also like to thank Chris Berg and his crew for technical assistance, the Wisconsin Institute interns and staff, and other people who have assisted tonight, and also for Joan Toyer for her presentation earlier this evening. For our distinguished media panel, we'd like to thank Mark Baldwin, Matt Lehman, and Pam Warnke. And finally, a round of applause for our candidates. Thank you so much for participating this evening.